this week. Go on mute is what we're going to do this week. And when we come <laughs> off mute, we're going to welcome Jason Haddix, the VP of Trust and Security at Bug Crown. Bug Crowd, rather. Our very own Keith Hoodlett will give a tech segment on bug bounty hunting. So basically, as Jeff said, we're going to let them talk for the first half of the show, or better, more than half. <laughs> then when we get to the security news, a smart lock can be hacked in seconds. A librarian sues Equifax. Uh, neighbors of a Cold War Air Force deserter only knew him as Tim, and his story is very interesting. And in the randomly pretend, potentially interesting stories, a defecating Pennsylvania driver. All that and more on this edition of Paul Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly for security professionals by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady. It's Paul Security Weekly. Welcome. Did Larry have an introduction? Hi, everyone. This is Paul Astor, and I guess I'm, I'm introducing... <laughs> Apparently, I no longer do. Okay. <laughs> wow, and I look short. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I accidentally uh, landed in New England and uh, stumbled my way to the G-Unit studio. That's pretty much how I envisioned it happening. <laughs> <Yeah. Job. laughs> Carlos, ha save the show, please. <laughs> yes, somebody's got to do it. <laughs> cannot be saved. Uh, well, it's good to have you back, Carlos. Jeff, welcome. Nice to have you in studio. It's great to be here, Paul. Try to stay awake for the whole episode. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We've been in studio dropping his phone We're incessantly while we chat. What? We're. Oh, hey. I'm, I'm in the studio with you guys. <laughs> That's kind of cool. Um, <laughs> NetSparker, the developers of desktop and cloud-based web application security scanners that enable you to automatically identify vulnerabilities in your web applications and web services. NetSparker scanners employ a unique and dead accurate vulnerability scanning engine that automatically verifies vulnerabilities with their proof of concept. For more information, visit them on the web at netsparker.com or email at contact at netsparker.com. In 2017, an increasing number of companies reported they did not have effective insider threat detection methods. Logarithm's UEBA solutions enable you to detect and neutralize user-based threats in real time, while built-in scenario and behavior-based analytics empower you to expose insider threats, compromised accounts, and privilege misuse. Visit Logarithm.com to learn how their UEBA solutions can help you expand visibility and enhance detection capabilities. Welcome to Paul Security Weekly. This is episode 564. It's June 14th, 2018, and I am in G Unit Studios in Rhode Island, and of course, your host, Paul Asadorian. On the lines via Skype, Mr. Jeff Mann is with us. Jeff, welcome. Hey, Paul. Uh, good to see you back in the studio again. I hope we didn't uh, stink it up too much last week filling in for you. I think you guys did great. Especially Matt reading from the teleprompter for his first time ever, uh, which was awesome. <laughs> also on the line. Yeah, Steve. I don't even think his lips moved. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mr. Keith Hoodlet is here with us on the lines via Skype. Welcome, Keith. Good eye, Paul. I, I mean, hi. <laughs> Sorry, I was trying to do my best Joff impression there and totally failed. Yes, uh, yeah, sort of. Joff sounds different than the. Anyway, welcome, Keith. Nice to have you uh, with us this evening. Uh, a couple of quick announcements. Make sure you come see us at Black Hat and DEF CON August 8th through the 12th. We're going to have a pool cabana or a hut or a gazebo or a, some kind of structure in the pool area. I think in this case, we're going to call it a cabana. Uh, we can watch us record live and grab some swag. So we'll be doing some trivia at uh, Black Hat. We'll be doing some recording of our shows at DEF CON. We'll be also uh, taking some uh, analyst briefings at Black Hat as well as, well as uh, doing some recorded interviews. So it's going to be a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, bring your bathing suit, I guess, because we'll be at the, at the pool. And uh, I heard Jack Daniel has a bikini. So if nothing else, you should come uh, check that out, maybe. I, no. I'm definitely not coming now, Paul. Thank okay. you for that. Okay, I mean, <laughs> Jack Daniel will be there, but not in a bikini. How about that? So then, Or even a Speedo, I trust. A Speedo, yes, a Speedo. Um, and make sure you check out some of our on-demand materials, securityweekly.com forward slash on-demand for some previously recorded webcasts. Always fun. So now we are going to introduce 
our very special guest for this evening, Jason Haddix, who is the Vice President of Trust and Security at Bug Crowd. Uh, Jason has uh, interest in the areas of mobile penetration testing, black box web application auditing. Uh, he was the director of penetration testing for HP Fortify previously and also held the number one rank on the Bug Crowd letterboard for 2014. Currently, he slipped to number 11, though. So clearly, Jason, you got to step up your game. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, it's hard to right, a job and full-time bug hunting is uh, sometimes incompatible. Right. Well, yeah. it's nice Why aren't we talking to the new number one? What I <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Jason, how did you get your start in information security? Um, you know, I, uh, I took a couple college classes when I was um, a younger man. And uh, basically, they had one called Ethical Hacking and Network Defense. And I had been hanging out with kind of the game reversing crew and uh, forums that probably I shouldn't have had any part of. But... Um, I realized that, oh, hey, this is a career. Um, so uh, I was working IT at the time, just help desk, really, really intro stuff, and um, managed to save up some money. And I put myself through uh, a couple of SANS um, mentorship programs, uh, the ones where you go and you work with them and you um, you get like access to you know reduced, course, uh, reduced cost course. And so I put myself through the pen testing course because I thought this is what I want to do. And, um, and mostly because you had had dinner and, and cigars with me one night, and I gave you invaluable yeah. career advice. Apparently, I think <laughs> I think so. I mean, of, of what I remember, yeah, no, I, <laughs> yeah. I, I find yeah, it interesting. So, uh, I gave Jason yeah. career advice, and he doesn't remember what it was, which means it probably wasn't all that useful anyway. So, <laughs> yeah, it was uh, the story was about five years ago. I met, I met you, and, uh, and we had cigars and drinks and some prolific sushi, actually, um, yes. with a lot of uh, I think with that Scotus and some other people. Um, and then, uh, and then you imparted on me some wisdom, but for, for the life of me, I don't remember what it was. So. <laughs> <laughs> you just know it was wisdom. <laughs> yeah. 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 It was good. If it came out of you, I, I trust it. It's good. Sure. It was probably don't let your cigar go out. <clears throat> That's some, yeah, some good advice. No. Maybe, maybe the right type of drink to hold. I'm not sure. <laughs> so, uh, you got involved with the Sands mentor program. <laughs> yeah. And then, um, I mean, it all kind of snowballed from there. I got my G pen. Um, I got my G wopped. I really liked web hacking. So, um, after that, I basically uh, applied to every pen testing job locally. There was uh, luckily there was a local one near me at a place called Redspin, uh, which is a small consultancy uh, near me in Southern California. Um, they gave me a chance, um, and uh, I worked with some really really excellent engineers there. Some of the smartest people I've ever worked with uh, went on to work on Apple security team, on Facebook security team, uh, Microsoft, and um, I got mentored. And then I brought some of the pen testing vibe in there because they mostly did audit. Um, and, uh, and it was good. And uh, worked on my web game. And then eventually I met Daniel Meisler at the same DEF CON and Black Hat I met you at. Mm -hmm. And um, I met him. We were doing a class together. There was CTF. It wasn't the DEF CON CTF, but it was a class CTF. And I think we placed second. And uh, afterwards he was like, hey, I'm starting up this, uh, this pen testing branch of Fortify. Um, to do the dynamic services as well as the static code analysis stuff and marry the two. Um, and he's like, you want to come work at HP? And at the time, I was like, I don't know. Um, I didn't know if it was the right thing to do, but I, I went over, and it's probably the best move of my life. Got to work with uh, a ton of awesome people, build out my own pen testing group, design methodology, run services, um, really really do a little bit of everything as the director. See, of now I remember what my advice to you was. It was... If someone from HP comes to you at some point in the future and offers you a job, you should take it. That was my mm -hmm. advice. <laughs> Clearly. Yeah, no, now back at it. It's all clear. It's clear. <laughs> so you worked with Daniel uh, at HP. Mm -hmm. And then yeah, at, and then, at uh, some point, were you like a full-time bug bounty hunter? <laughs> uh, that's a, that's a heated, heated and loaded question. So uh, while I was working at HP nights, I was spending um, hunting uh, on bug crowd. I, I remember getting the first email from bug crowd uh when they called them beta programs mm -hmm. and i was part of beta 001 and beta 002 and basically it was an email to your inbox from casey and it said hey we're doing this like pen test sort of thing but you get paid if you find things you don't get paid if you don't find things and if you're the first to find it you get paid but if you're the second to find it you don't really get anything um but you know back before bug bounties contract work for pen testing if you wanted to moonlight was um, and still is difficult, right? Like mm -hmm. setting up, you know, your LLC, 
um, getting contracts together, reporting, everything involved with it is kind of a giant headache unless you do it really often. And I wasn't someone who was doing it often. So I was like, yeah, if it's easy, you know, whatever. And it was simple. It was really simple. There was a form you fill out with the vulnerability. Um, and that was the beginning of the end to me. I was absolutely addicted to bounty hunting. The ease of it, the amount of time I could just focus on actual testing. Um, obviously, I was, I was decent at it. So um, I started doing that while I was at HP. And I got obsessed. Um, and uh, I got obsessed. And I was basically playing on the leaderboard against a guy named Bitcork, another hacker on the boards. Um, and, uh, he was number one and I was number two and we were leading into DEF CON and Black Hat where they were going to do an awards ceremony for a number one hacker. And I could not, uh, I could not lose. I, I basically pushed myself, uh, to hack probably way more hours than I should have. You can ask my wife, she'd probably, uh, mm. probably tell you stories about that time. But, uh, but eventually I got number one and Bug Crowd invited me over to work with them. So that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, how have, uh, well, first uh, I want to point out that I, uh, completely agree with your sentiments. Uh, as I created a pen test company, and had to do all the paperwork, you know, associated with that. In addition to you know working a full time job, um, and it can also impact your career uh, as well. You know, talking about a, a career focused uh, topic uh, this Saturday. But you know, it, when you work for a company and you're like, well, I'm going to go, you know, test your competitors' security, or you know, there's a lot of potential conflicts of interest that could. Uh, occur in that scenario but you still have that urge that you want to like break into stuff and not yep. break the law so i think a bug bounty is a great avenue uh to do that uh, how have yep. bug bounties changed uh you know since the beginning time jason haven't been firsthand you know uh in the weeds with this stuff from early on yeah you know it's uh it's matured a lot both in a lot of ways so uh basically before um there used to be a lot of problems in the space with how quickly uh, and timely that the customers who were running the bug bounties uh, got back in touch with the researchers and the hackers. Um, so there was this giant lag time in between the time you submitted something and the time you saw if it was valid. Um, and then there was also discrepancies on pays out, payouts. There wasn't like a large, basically industry accepted kind of range. Um, the types of bugs that people would accept were all over the place, right? Like. Um, what's really funny is, is if you do like a pen test, right? Like, uh, and I've seen hundreds of pen tests across my desk at some point, it's like, uh, you, you can find anywhere from five really decent findings or maybe with a critical in there, which are awesome to maybe 15 or 20 on a, on a pen test report. Usually that's, that's what I would average. I don't know if that's exactly accurate, but, um, in a, in a bug bounty, um, you see hundreds of submissions, um, and some of them are risk rated. Some of them are obscure. Um, and so like before they didn't have any of the triage and validation really buttoned down and it was, um, it was difficult in the beginning, but now, um, all of that, you know, all of the vendors, especially bug crowd in specific has done a lot to push forward SLAs and, and common, um, basically risk rating for the vulnerabilities. And so it really, uh, it really makes it easy for the hunter, right? You can really focus on on testing, not worry about kind of getting skunked when it comes to, um, you know, putting in your findings and stuff like that. And uh, you can focus on the stuff you want to do, like, you know, reversing or hacking or, you know, whatever it is you chose to, to hunt on. Jason, in your opinion, what, when is a company ready to have a bug bounty program? Uh, this is this is a good question because uh, Keith and I have a philosophical kind of argument when it comes to this question, actually. Um, so I think that... Um, I think that after you've had a number of DAS scanning and pen testing and maybe a yearly pen test for either compliance uh, with a decent firm, you're ready to engage in like a private bug bounty um, to get the, the value that you get out of it, right? The amount of findings, the number of eyes, the diverse skill sets and stuff, and stuff like that. Um, and uh, I think that when you, when you are technically ready, when you're considered medium or high maturity and you dive into bug bounty, um, I think that you should put, you know, as much stuff in scope as you can uh, for the bug bounty and um, and know about all the security vulnerabilities as early as possible. Um, because as a, you know, as a customer, if I were on the other end, um, you know, I don't want to limit myself. I want to know everything I can know about, um, uh, about the security of my websites or assets or whatever. Um, but there are people on the other end of the spectrum who say, hey, you know, development organizations can only handle so much security information at any given time. Um, and really, they're, you know, the more you basically dump on them, the less valuable the service becomes. So why not 
uh, take it in chunks over a long period of time. So um, there are there are different schools of thought on that. Keith is on the the side of I think um, basically uh, uh, rolling it out, and I am on the side of I want to know all of my risk um, as soon as possible. Um, so so yeah. Now, couldn't I set a a low uh, payout amount for my bug bounties and go in before I'm ready and come out ahead because I haven't paid a lot of money to do some other stuff? Is it cheaper to do it that way? Can I cheat? Can I hack the system essentially? Uh, I mean, so what you can do is a responsible disclosure program, um, which uh, which offers just points on the bug crowd system or on any of the systems. Really, um, you're not guaranteed activity. Um, and you don't get enough, you don't get uh, as much skill as a regular program, Mm -hmm. but you can run something like that just to get ready so that you know what it's like to intake the vulnerability information through the bug bounty. And, uh, when you do get, you know, large numbers of stuff, whether it be criticals or mediums or lows, um, you'll also build out your process and how to pass it to your development team, which is the really important part is understanding how to take it and, and disseminate it inside the organization. Um, and you, you can start off with low payments. You know, a lot of people do start off with low payments because they want, you know, they want to get rid of the low hanging fruits, right. uh, you know, uh, right away. Uh, it just depends on how far along you are on that maturity scale. Mm. <clears throat> In the years that bug bounties have existed, um, wh- what's stopping someone from being in a bug bounty program as the attacker persona and discovering a major vulnerability and then saying, you know, I'm just going to keep this to myself, maybe sell it to someone else that has a higher payout uh, or sell it to some foreign government. Do you think that stuff goes on? As long as I've been here and involved in this, I have never seen that. It's a common thought experiment that a lot of people have, right? But what we're dealing with here is, is application bugs and mostly custom code. So it's specific to, one application and one customer. Um, and then, you know, even if you're like a, a big name customer, um, I don't see a big market for those type of bugs on the black market and on the dark web, right? They're, they're, they want caught software that's installed everywhere. They want um, service exploits. You know, those are the type of things that they want um, and they'll pay a lot of money for what they want. Well, so, exploits, yeah, that's right? interesting, Jason. So it's really market demand that kind of polices this issue that bug crowd and other bug bounty programs are probably paying higher in, yeah. in i'll leave to your expert opinion on that but higher than what you would fetch in the black market because different types of exploits that are more ubiquitous and allow you to build much bigger botnets carry a higher yeah. uh payout on on the dark yeah. web absolutely that's that's somewhat correct and then you know we try to police it with the way we vet the crowd right mm. so um you know if you're a risk adverse company and you're really worried about something like that uh, I mean, the, the core argument is like attackers are already looking for those types sure. of things anyway, if, if that conversation even exists. But um, if you're a risk adverse company, you come on to do a bug bounty. You're not starting with a public one. You're usually starting with a private one, um, which feels more like a pen test. And we give you our most vetted researchers who are background checked, ID verified, um, have been through at least, you know, a number of other private programs and worked with some of our key clients. And we've had interactions with them, maybe even interviews. So. Um, so at that point, you, when you funnel down the researcher pool, you're getting less people, but they're very vetted, um, and you still get the same amount of success. And so that's what we really recommend for the super vetted or for the super risk adverse type client. Do clients ever come to you and they're just like totally not ready? Yes, that has absolutely happened. Um, and we, we try to make sure it doesn't happen. Um, but you know, sometimes people just... Uh, you know, they get like a Nessa scan and they come in saying they've had pen tests, but really mm-hmm. they've had like, you know, a scanner shop or something like that come in and assess them. And um, they've never really had in-depth network analysis or in-depth web application penetration testing. Um, and so they come on and they get wrecked and um, they get a lot of value, uh, but sure. they have no idea what to do with the amount of security homes that they receive, um, you know, somewhere upwards of, you know, maybe... I'd say the breaking point for a lot of people is 20 priority ones, like show stopping bugs, maybe 15 priority ones. Um, then, then they're like, they start to get, um, you know, a little bit of the, the shock. And so uh, that's, that's our job, honestly, that's customer service. People like Keith, who were in the solutions architect role to step in, help them figure out how to deal with that, pause the program, um, figure out when a relaunch is necessary, make sure that the bugs get triaged, 
correctly and the risk rated correctly. And so that's kind of the, the whole dog and pony and shtick that we, we bring to it is, is the, you know, the consultancy part of making sure that you don't just get wrecked by a bug bounty. Yeah. And that's, uh, sorry, my brain's totally in my talk. Uh, that's, you know, part of the, uh, objections, right. Of someone that wants to do a bug bounty program. I would imagine the number one objection is, Oh my God, what if I have to pay out like millions of dollars and I can't afford it? Yeah. It's never been millions of, uh, millions of dollars, like out of the gate. I don't think, um, you know, over the, over the life cycle of a, a really good program. Yes, maybe. But, um, yeah, I mean, there is the opportunity to get uh, really good security information, but really what you have to think about is had you have, you know, saw that in like your regular pen test world, um, you know, you would have paid way more than a million dollars for that kind of security information. Right. And you identified that risk way earlier in your life cycle. Um, so although it's painful to deal with on the operations and development side, um, you know about it and you, you got it at a, you know, a, a premium. Um, and you got to work with some of the best testers in the world who you would have never gotten to hire through any consultancy because they just don't work for consultancies. They, they work on their own doing this type of work. Mm. Keith, do you have more things to add? Um, well, gosh, I'm going to be covering a lot of this stuff in a few minutes. Uh, what has been, so maybe, maybe this is a, this is a leading question, Haddix, but what has been <laughs> the, the most exciting talk you've given uh, in terms of a conference related to perhaps bug bounties? And, um, and what were some of the things you covered in that talk? Uh, yeah, so um, I think my DEF CON talk with, uh, with JP Villanueva um, here, he's one of the other solutions engineers, was one of my favorites. So what we did is we, um, we basically took every vulnerability um, that matched a certain category on bug crowd. Um, let's say SQL injection or cross-site scripting, or um, actually we didn't do cross-site scripting because it varied so much, but SQL injection, local file includes server-side template injection, a whole bunch of web bugs that were critical. And uh, what we did is we nuked the private customer information, but kept the parameters. And what we did is we ran statistical analysis on all the parameters that had those vulnerabilities on them. And so we made a burp extension um, that basically listens to all of your traffic when you visit a website. And when it sees a parameter that's most often vulnerable to SQL injection or insecure direct object reference or server-side template injection or some of these uh, P1 style bugs, it alerts you and it gives you resources inside a burp. It's called Hunt. The extension is called Hunt. Um, and uh, it gives you suggestions on how to test manually. And it just says, hey, you might want to look at this because most often... Um, this is vulnerable to this class of vulnerability. It's not actually doing any of the testing. Um, but I got to tell you, most of the bugs that I see come through the platform or that I find myself um, match the regex as we're using in Hunt. And I find a lot of my bugs using Hunt running in the background. That's really interesting. Yeah. Jeff. I have a few questions, and I'm going to sure. pretend to play, play dumb and just ask some, some kind of basic question. Yeah. Um, you, you, you mentioned, uh, SQL injection. So, you know, that's, that's not a new thing that's been around for a while. Um, I guess what I'm curious about is, is how many of the vulnerabilities that are discovered through bug bounty programs, uh, tend to fall into, uh, you know, the OWASP top 10 bucket versus, finding something extremely new and different and out there that nobody's ever thought of before. You know, we still see a lot of OWASP top 10, unfortunately, right? It's not a solved problem space. Um, SQL injection is still out there. Um, but uh, really, and this is just me kind of riffing off the top of my head. I don't have any like hard numbers um, to back any of this right now, but um, you know, those things still exist and we still see them. We see them the most in older organizations who haven't caught up to newer frameworks a, a lot. Um, but then when we look at, if you cut down into a subsection of newer frameworks, what we do see, um, is a lot of business logic flaws, right? Like there's nothing, there's no framework that really protects you, uh, from an insecure direct object reference or like a missing function level access bug. Things were like, you get, you know, an ID that says two zero zero one and you change it to two zero 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 and you get somebody else's account data. Um, so right. those kind of things are always prevalent and those are in the OWASP top 10. Um, but, uh, but they're still prevalent in newer frameworks that protect against things like CSER, cross-site scripting, SQL injection, the old school, 
kind of injection class bugs. Um, and then we also see subsets of a lot of parser abuse. So server-side template injection can kind of be considered a parser abuse. Obviously, XML entity injection is parser abuse. Um, and then a lot of classes these days are actually like uh, cloud-related, right? So uh, people not applying the right permissions to their AWS S3 buckets um, or other cloud providers. And so uh, finding keys for those things, information leakage, um, people hosting Git on their live sites and then forgetting that people can download repositories from, from their live sites and look at commit data. Um, so okay, a lot so of those Do you, do you put uh, are, deserialization bugs in the class of parsing or is that a separate class in your opinion? Uh, I count it as a separate class. Um, I actually get asked about it a lot. This is a common question about deserialization bugs. Um, you know, I don't see a ton, honestly, coming coming across. Maybe... I would say out of the top 10 bugs or some of the ones I was just talking about, uh, maybe it's like one out of every 10 or something like that um, of P1s. But I mean, that's still a relatively high um, benchmark. But uh, yeah, deserialization bugs, I, I wouldn't count in, in parser abuse. And uh, I have more questions. Uh, uh, just yeah. right. well, really quick, and then we'll, we'll go to Jeff. Mm -hmm. How many of the bugs that people are reporting are completely like creative and unique to that application? And how many of them rely on vulnerabilities that have been previously disclosed, or do you combine some of those together? Um, so I don't know if we've ever really looked at like the cross section of CVEs and known vulnerabilities to what's been um, discovered, unless the researcher like includes that in their write up. Mm. Um, but I would just say, if I were to guess, most of them are unique uh, to the application. Uh, themselves, right? It's custom code. It's a custom coded application, so there's no CVE for that, right? Um, so most of our bugs are in that category. Mm. Jeff? Well, that sort of touches on one of the questions I had just in the whole uh, discipline of bug bounty, if you will, uh, and maybe, you know, does bug crowd uh, uh, orchestrate any of this? But I was just curious as to, you know, reporting. So Bugs are discovered, people get points, get on the leaderboard, but the bugs that are discovered, are they uh, handled in a particular way? Does it vary from you know company to company that offered the bug bounty in the first place in terms of reporting, disclosure, the whens and the hows and the ifs, that type of thing? Yeah, absolutely. So when a bug comes in from a researcher, it enters in uh, basically a new state. Um, on our platform, our engineers go through and they risk rate it and validate it first, right? So that we don't want to give our customers anything but signal. We don't want them to get caught in this trap of getting too much uh, noise, basically, we call it signal to noise ratio. Um, so uh, when the customer logs in, they get everything that's validated and risk rated. Um, and uh, it's inside what looks like a very complex vulnerability management platform, which we call uh, crowd control. Um, and so uh, basically you have what looks like an inbox on the left of all of your bugs that you need to review. And on your right, you have um, what would look like a standard pen test page, right? Where it has the issue information, um, links, and then uh, that system, the whole platform, is integrated into things like your Jira or your Slack. And so, um, you know, tickets can be created for pushing this towards your development teams when you set that integration up. And so... Um, really, we're trying to push left as much as much as possible with um, that, but we do have exports for common uh, reporting schemes. So if you're used to a pen test report, we have a PDF export that looks very much like a pen test report with uh, coverage metrics, analytics on what types of bugs were found. It's got the classic, you know, high, medium, low graph in page three, um, has a letter of attestation, things like that. So we're very willing to export the data in that format. You can get it as CSV. You can get it from an API and integrate it to your own systems. Um, and then you can you can take it from the platform and integrate it directly to Jira. Interesting. I have two more questions, if I may, Paul. Sure. Um, the first one is, you know, I'm looking at the Bug Crowd website and seeing the whole list of companies that are, I guess, participants in various bug bounty programs. I, I know that there's rankings. Not sure. I guess there's levels of involvement, new rewards, swag, hall of fame. Not sure what that means, but uh, it, you know, I've heard lots of debate of of whether to do bug bounties or not. I'm curious as to whether you have seen any particular stigma uh, applied to companies that either 
do show up on this list as participating in a bug bounty or the or the reverse uh, companies that you would expect to see up there that aren't participating you know what what are so, sort of some of the you know what's you know, what, what kind of flack do companies get for either participating or not participating um for not participating in a bug bounty i've seen i've seen more flack in that area right like uh, mm -hmm. you're gonna see over the next couple of years uh, the government and, and major policy, basically, documents come out and say that this is part of a, a broad-scale application security uh, program, right? You should have, at, at the very least, maybe not a bug bounty, but a responsible disclosure or, coordinated, or a coordinated disclosure policy. And whether you run that yourself or through a platform like us, you need to have it. You need to have a place where people can submit software bugs to you um, in order to, you know, have best practice. Um, now, bug bounty, that, that'll come, you know, maybe in the next... You know, two two years, three years, maybe somewhere around there, um, and, and that brings incentivization with it. And um, as far as the sentiment, really, uh, we see a lot of uh, bigger customers, like in in finance and automotive, um, they are getting a lot of pressure to implement a bug bounty because, especially with things like cars and um, high scale financial, you know, sites that handle a lot of money, um, they. Uh, their auditors want to make sure that they are risk-free. They don't want things like Equifax to happen. Um, and, and this is one of the methods where you can provide an input and ease a little bit of that pressure so that you get some of these things reported in a responsible way rather than uh, end up in the newspapers, really. Um, the inverse of that would be, you know, is there is there anybody who has a bug bounty, I guess the question, and that people are like, oh, because you have a bug bounty, we don't want to work with you? I've never heard that before. Um, hmm. But it, it's a possibility, I guess. Um, I mean, yeah, I'm not, I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but I, yeah, I mean, I've never had a, a friend or a customer or somebody in the industry or another hacker say like, yeah, because we had a bug bounty program and we invite people to give us cool security information and we're a pretty forward thinking company when it comes to our security team, um, they didn't want to work with us. I've never heard that before. Cool. Final question, uh, and it's just a curiosity. Uh, what is the difference, in your opinion, between bug bounty programs as, you, as you've been describing them this evening and something like a, a crowdsourced pen test? There's not much difference, really. Um, people want to package it a little bit differently, um, you know, and say say whatever they want to say. But, uh, you know, it, it kind of comes down to, you know, you're inviting people, um, you know, hackers or researchers. Um, in either a time box faction or, you know, permanently to either publicly or privately hack on your assets. Um, now, the way okay. it's packaged and the way you allow access, those are the variables, right? So um, if you're only running it for two weeks and you give people a coverage report like we do, and then you uh, funnel people through a VPN and make sure it's an ID verified crowd, and then you tailor the report like every other pen test uh, that the customer has seen and every other pen test and auditor has seen, and it's just way better, we package that, we package that as our pen test product um, because most people are very familiar with that. Um, but really, it's, it's all crowdsourced security. It's, it's all some form of bringing really talented researchers on um, to solve security problems uh, on some type of application or technology. Um, and it's just how you, you provision the access or the duration um, and how you build the crowds. Those are the variables. I have a, an additional question. I kind of know the answer to it, but I still want to ask all the same for our listeners, Paul, uh, if that's okay. Sure. So, uh, Jason, for getting into bug bounties, I mean, obviously I know because I'm, I'm into them myself, but uh, for the listeners out there, if they're interested in getting started in bug bounty programs, um, what advice do you have in terms of maybe books or resources that people should go and look at? Um, I, I'm going to be covering a bunch of tools here in the tech segment that, that I've actually learned from you. Um, but what sort of uh, kind of getting started tips do you have for our listeners if they're interested in, in jumping in? Yeah, absolutely. Um, in fact, most of the questions you guys have been throwing over the fence are like are like me answering like salesy questions. I actually more geek out on, on hacking things. So, <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, I mean, uh, there's about four books that I recommend to everybody who's getting into application assessment. And the majority, I would say, of the bug bounty industry is assessing applications. Um, so... Um, the resources, the written resources, would be the Webblication Hackers Handbook version two. And uh, whenever I say that, people groan a little bit. They're like, "That book has been out for like five years or whatever." Uh, the WA, as it's effectively loved and, and called, 
um, is is the web application hacking bible, right? It is it contains the building blocks for every vulnerability. Um, it outlines how uh, injection flaws in the core problem of taking in user input and somehow using it affects web applications. So I would highly suggest that book for people just getting started. Um, and what a lot of people don't know about that book is it's actually Associated Labs. So um, if you go to mdsec.com, the authors of the book have set up labs that follow each chapter. And so it's what I put my students when they go through. Uh, I have an application security boot camp that I, I teach to veterans and um, people who are uh, you know just getting in every once in a while to security. Um, it's what I have them start with is those mdsec labs. Um, the OWASP testing guide is a wonderful resource. It's a little dense, but it's free and it's on it's on OWASP. It's on revision four, I think, right now. Um, and then there's there's three other kind of books that recently have just come out that are, are pretty good. So one is Web Hacking 101 um, by Peter Jaworski, um, who's a bug bounty hunter, and he goes through a whole bunch of methods and write ups and and just parses the information really well. Um, there's another one by Andy Gill called Breaking into Information Security. And then there's another one called Mastering Modern Web Penetration Testing. And those are the five core books that I recommend anybody getting into this use. Now, that's, that's book reading. But if you, uh, if you actually want to do this, you have to actually you know, test your skills and have some place to hack. And so on top of getting in on the public programs on, on BugCrowd and testing those sites, you can also stand up you know, your own kind of stuff like Damn Vulnerable Web Application. And, um, and there's a wonderful project by OWASP called the OWASP Vulnerable Web Applications Directory, which has listed every single vulnerable app that almost anybody has ever made. Um, and it just has it listed there. So you can go download them, install them, and start you know, basically popping web shells. You know what? Um, uh, a lot of those today, but, Jason, when I look at them, yeah. uh, are in containers. So mm -hmm. if you want to go learn Docker and read about Docker, it, I mean, you really, the knowledge you need of Docker is pretty small to get to the point where you can identify someone who's taken like DVWA and putting it in Docker and with just one command, that app yep. is running. That saves you so yep. much time and like the oh my God, it's so and setup, great. right? I, I remember when, trust they, that when those person. first came out and we, we couldn't do that. You had to set up the old, you, mm -hmm. all, your whole web server, which was great, right? Because actually yeah. having people do that is... is yeah, I, know, I, I agree, Jason. I would recommend people do that first. Do it the yeah. hard way first. <laughs> yeah. And then once yeah. you've mastered that, then use Docker because it's just easier. Yeah, absolutely. Most of them come with Docker containers that you can spin up. And um, and that's so like that has like newer ones like Juice Shop and it has uh, BWAP, which I think is a wonderful broken web application for people to test. And then um, there's specific ones to newer technologies like Node. There's damn vulnerable Node app. There's web services challenges. Um, and so when I get my students who I'm teaching either bug bounty hunting or AppSec, just in general AppSec testing, um, I put them through the ringer and make them do all of that stuff. And uh, I make them stand up the environments themselves and also break them down. And then what I do on top of that is I force them to submit them kind of like a bug bounty. So they know, um, you know, like how to do write-ups, how to write reports really mm -hmm. well, how to formulate, you know, proof of concepts and, and things like that. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, uh, with Docker containers, so you have to trust that repository as well. Oh, yeah, you we, do. we have a story about that, which I, I don't often trust, but... <laughs> yeah. Um, more questions for Jason. I feel like all of uh, mine I'm, would just be things that I've I've already asked him before, and it would just be rehashing of all of our furious debates. So I don't. Yeah, wanna, but our listeners haven't haven't heard that yet, Keith. True. True. So it's it's interesting um, because as as some people know from my Twitter post today, today was actually my last day at, at Bug Crowd. I was. Uh, working for Jason for about 10 months, and then I ended up working in the solution. Today's your last day, but what the hell, dude? No one fucking told me. Yep. Oops. No one told <laughs> me. to drop that. <laughs> no, He's hanging up. Don't let him go. Uh, so, so the funny thing is is that Haddock's totally new. Um, but, <laughs> but No, we didn't. Uh, I thought we were going to disclose this on the show. <laughs> even still, even still, um, I don't even know where I was going with this. Uh, I totally <laughs> lost, uh, <laughs> um, That's a hell of a way to learn on the podcast, right? You're like, yo, I'm leaving. Right. Peace. Like, <laughs> <laughs> he just he just literally drops some knowledge, totally throws throws me for a loop, monkey wrench, and then I'm gone. Um, yeah. So so no, I think I, I've got what I was going to say, which is um, obviously when I was working at Bug Crowd, I, I was with a vendor, and so I had a, a specific view of the world, right? 
I'm actually going to Thermo Fisher Scientific, where I'm going to be the application security manager for their global application security program. So I'm, I'm building it from the ground up, which is an awesome experience for me to have. Um, and so Jason and I have often gone back and forth on the idea of, do you want to know everything or do you want to know just as much as, as you can give to your development team to handle? Um, it, it's funny because Addicts or J uh, Jason uh, wants to know everything. Me, I'm very much a developer at heart, and I realize that there's a, the concept of morale, and if you kill morale on that team, you also kill any goodwill that you have by giving them too much. So I, I guess maybe for for Paul, and as well as for yourself, Jeff, based on your experience in the security industry as well, because you guys worked in the vulnerability management space, um, and you know, to Jason as well, when is uh, too much. When is there a point where you've hit too many findings? Is there a point that you've hit too many findings? So, have at it. I think there is, but provided I'm provided the findings are accurate, I, there's no such thing as too many findings. Because if there you, you go. how do you prioritize something that you don't know about? I agree and All I right. disagree. But I actually wanted to start, uh, Keith, by asking you a question. You know, you're about to flip sides and, and become a consumer. Uh, are you going into this thinking, well, of course I'm going to set up a bug bounty program, or is there a part of you that says, damn it, I want to do my, I want to build a program well enough and build, you know, and, and hire smart developers and teach them and educate them, and I know all the things that they need to do to stay sharp. I, I want to, I want to be the guy that doesn't need a bug bounty program. As much as I would love to be the guy that doesn't need a bug bounty program, the truth of the matter is that I am absolutely going to be planning to incorporate that as part of my strategy. Because at the end of the day, in my mind, uh, when, especially when it comes to developers, right, when they receive feedback from a tool like a DAST or a SAS scanner, it's a robot that's reproduce, reproducing that report. So a lot of the times that gets written off, right? It's either uh, false positive or it's you know it's not supposed to function that way so they're just not going to fix it so six to 12 months later they finally address those findings now if you get a pen test like a traditional pen test that you bring in and they do a tabletop exercise or that you bring them inside of your network or what have you even still developers will say that's a sandbox that's a tabletop exercise they were inside of our network they bypassed our WAF whatever uh, three to six months from initial time of testing to time of fix, because it takes anywhere from two weeks or so to do the test, another week or two to get the report, and then finally you start prioritizing before you even start fixing. When it comes to a bug bounty program, it's real hackers on the real internet hacking your real application. Uh, Wait, that one, end, one would argue though that a pen test is the same three elements though. <laughs> Not necessarily depending on the way that you do the pen test or the application assessment. So you might be able to do it behind the firewall. So as the pen tester will tell you, I'm not here to test your firewall rules. I'm here to test your application. So you let them in past the firewall, right? So suddenly your developers are already having less trust in what they're actually producing because they're, be they're not behind a, a WAF, right? So the difference is with most, if not uh, many of the bug bounty programs that I've seen, still have the WAF in place. So if you get beyond the WAF and the application protections that might exist elsewhere, suddenly it's a very real finding that exists in the real world, even if it's a, a staging environment. A really good example of that actually is Okta. So they have a public bug bounty program on BugCrab. And the way that they've set that up is it's a staging environment for all of their code that they are going to push the following month. And so what they do is they have researchers provision their own accounts, test in this environment, and then any findings that come in get fixed before the push to actual production where the other customers are using their product. And so you're getting all the real testing with the WAF and all of everything else that's in there from a security uh, safety standpoint. But you're also getting real findings and it's real hackers. So now you know as soon as it's come in, th th first that it's valid, right? So you, we have, in this case, Bug Crowd's team that is going to be triaging and validating. And then on top of that, you know that it's a duplicate or not of what, anything you already know about, whether that's from a DAS or a SAS tool, yeah, but whether if, that's from another researcher. If, if I were to set up a staging environment like that, I would have two staging environments. I'd have one that was protected with a WAF and one that wasn't, and there would be a higher bounty if you could bypass the one with the WAF. 
because conceivably that's how you should do in my mind how you should do the web application test is you should do the test uh without protections and then with protections like a WAF to see if you can get your exploit through but find all of the problems and then see if my protections are effective and then let me prioritize but i still want to know about everything keith so i have yeah i mean of... go ahead jeff well, well, I, I want to say I agree with Paul, uh, you know, to the degree that, um, you know, when I used to do pen testing and when I used to, you know, be the guy doing the biz dev selling pen testing, one of the debates we always had with our customers and our prospective customers was this, you know, do you want to, are you testing just the, the perimeter security protections that you have or do you want to know what's really wrong in your environment? Similar to what you're describing, you know, you know, is the is the web application behind a WAF or not? You know, there's merits to looking at it both ways, which which is why I think ideally both scenarios should be tested. Because if you put all your eggs in the perimeter security or the WAF security basket, you don't really know what's going on necessarily that that is you know devastating or critical vulnerability in your app. That you know, all you have to do is wait for you know somebody to just uh, accidentally make a you know change a rule in the WAF or you know disable it or an update doesn't doesn't work and it, it kicks it offline. You know whatever you know these impossible scenarios are that never happen in the real world. Uh, ver versus you you want to look at actually what the application is. But going back to the earlier question i'll let you pick it up again though keith is there t such a thing as too many vulnerabilities having been in this business for 35 years I i'm depressed when i when i think of how many vulnerabilities that we're still dealing with and coming up with new ones today and, and as haddox was describing so many of the vulnerabilities very often have to do with older frameworks or you know, basically known stuff or known problems or configurations or practices. Uh, I would like to think, you know, before I give up my last breath in this industry, that we could somehow figure out how to uh, not necessarily eliminate vulnerabilities, but get them to something manageable and move on to something else. So I have I think one point. I want to kick it back to Jason because he's the guest here, right? So... Yep. My my thought is, especially with WAF based versus, um, you know, in the clear type testing is almost exactly what you've already covered, Jeff, which is that the vulnerability still exists if the WAF is there or not. And the more realistic scenario here is that you don't renew your license with that WAF vendor and you go with somebody else and suddenly you're vulnerable again. That's a very real problem that happens. It's it's not like that. It just went offline. It's that you switched vendors. Right. <laughs> So hmm. that that is something that I think is a, is a real problem. I'm sure that uh, Jason can comment on that as a researcher ourselves, you know, both him and my myself included. We actually look for WAF bypasses or we ask our community of other researchers about WAF bypasses when we encounter one. And by the way, they exist and we actually leverage them as hunters anyway. Um, so even to that state, you can you kind of get a. Uh, extra bonus here, which is not only do you find out that your WAF isn't working, but you also find out that you have a vulnerability on top of that, which is, you know, a huge benefit. So um, to answer the original question, do I intend to have bug bounties as part of my strategy? Yes. And the reason is because developers treat that as the most real form of actually being hacked and proving that they have a vulnerability. Um, Thankfully, I, I believe that a lot of the developers I'm going to be working with at Thermo Fisher are really forward leaning and understand that vulnerabilities exist in their code and are, are going to work toward fixing them with what I'm, I'm going to be able to provide to them, which will hopefully be all of the vulnerabilities. But, you know, there's always those unknown unknowns. And I think that bug bounties will help you find all of those things that your DAST and your SAS tooling misses, because let's face it, it takes weeks or months for those to update with new checks for vulnerabilities. Um, so to, to Jason, um, first, how often do you see WAF bypasses coming into uh, bug bounties that either you've performed or maybe other researchers that you know are, are working on? Uh, but then also, I'm, I want to let you weigh in on your feedback on this debate because we've had this debate back and forth quite a bit. Yeah, I mean, I don't think my argument is, is like uh, is super technical, right? It's, it's as, a, as a security leader inside of an organization, I want to know all of my risk and be able to prioritize it myself, right? Um, to know where I can spend that limited budget that I have um, to protect my organization. And without visibility, I can't do that. So I want to know about everything up front. 
um, and I'll use the bug bounty wherever I go to help me discover um, on top of everything else, on top of pen testing, on top of data scanning, on top of source code analysis um, and threat model, right? I will do everything, but bug bounty will be a core component um, and bug bounty pays, you know, uh, you know, you, in comparison with, you know, like a continuous pen test for a year, um, you can get a bug bounty to do some of that work too as well. So uh, I will leverage them. Um, I want to know everything. Uh, not really a complicated argument. I want to have visibility. Um, the the other thing about like WAF testing and stuff like that, you know, the, I chuckled when you when you said um, the WAF stuff is because yeah, we see WAF bypasses all the time. But like the recent one I just did on on a bounty was um, you know it's pretty simple. I was up against um, a WAF of some sort on the main domain for a company, and um, I thought I had an injection flaw, but uh, I kept on getting blacklisted. In fact, um, a lot of the newer cloud. Uh, protection suites, they'll call them, uh, Akamai, Cloudflare. Um, if you start submitting too much bad traffic, they'll actually ban your IP from a global blacklist. So like it stops my wife from going to <laughs> book flights at United, which is, she hates. She hates that a lot. Um, eventually, she'll come into my room and she's like, did you do it again? And I'll be like, yeah, I did it again. I'm sorry. Um, but uh, you know, Julia. eventually I got, <laughs> what'd you say? Sorry. I said your poor wife. <laughs> I know. I know. Um, eventually, uh, that site, you know, was was pretty simple, right? I was testing www.site.com, um, and obviously they had they had a load balanced environment, and so I, you know, I knew that they had other servers hosted www1, www2, um, and eventually it, it was my dummy idea just to be like, I wonder if the if the WAF is enabled on www1, www2, or origin .client, whatever name, um, and eventually. One of those panned out, and they didn't have the WAF scheduled to protect that. And I verified the injection, and they were all using a shared database, and that was that was the end of that. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, bypasses don't come in the form always of um, of basically some fancy encoding or you know mm -hmm. some silly trick, or uh, they come in the, the silly ways that like somebody didn't enable it on all on all the architecture. Um, or you know, yeah, they forgot to pay the bill. <laughs> like, um, you know, and so. When it comes back to, do you test with WAF? Do you test without WAF? Um, you know, that's that's up to the company, really. Uh, I think, um, you know, I think that it's it does carry more weight when a researcher or a bug bounty hunter finds a vulnerability even past a WAF, and so you can, like he said, prioritize it to a development team or a security organization or even executives and be like, we had all of our shields up and we still, you know, found a critical vulnerability. Um, so uh, this should be taken seriously. It should be prioritized um, accordingly. Um, but also, if you want complete coverage, you know, uh, I always, when I was a pen tester, I always, you know, you always had that discussion of like, oh, you're going to do internal pen testing. Um, you also want some auditing done. You need to give us, you know, creds to do credentialed audit auditing or something like that. And so there is some benefit there too. I guess it all just, you know, kind of goes back to the organization, what they've previously done for testing and, and their appetite for you know, exposing things to the public. Jason, you don't proxy your traffic through China when you do your bug bounties? <laughs> <laughs> just, uh, just saying. I do for some stuff. I, I forget sometimes, though, right? When you have mm. that VPN on, and then all of a sudden, you know, it craps out, and you're, you're testing from your home IP. I little hairy, so. <laughs> Yeah, every pen tester that was listening to you is like, he's doing it from home, and he's not proxying or filtering in any way. Yeah. Hmm. Usually. Hey. Usually I do. Hey, I, I, did, so, I had another question. It, um, it, uh, hope, hopefully it's a philosophical question. What I'm hearing you say is that good developers write bad code sometimes. Uh, it, you know, how, how do we advance how, as, 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 a, as, a, as a industry or as developers? Uh, I mean, I'm sure people learn as they go and, and, and you know, oh, I won't do that again. But is there such a thing as getting beyond sort of that knee-jerk reactionary, oh, I won't do that again, that way to, and how how do developers, you know, sort of learn to be, to, to do more secure coding and, and, and advance this whole thing? Not to eliminate Jeff, the need for bug bounties. Jeff, we have the, this whole new show. It's called Application Security Weekly. <laughs> <laughs> It, you know, it, it's funny because I was going to say uh, I'm not ready to announce it yet, but I am actually working on a, a project that I hope to address exactly what you're getting to, uh, Jeff, as well. So that will probably be announced in the next Wait, few months. Wait, hold on, Keith. You've got a project that's going to make everyone write good, secure code? Why, yeah. why have you been keeping this from me? 
<laughs> it's it's so not yet to ready to be unveiled, job. but I am working on something. Um, and can I just wrap up one one thing, which is to get back to the original question that Jeff asked. Uh, now that I'm moving into a management position inside of a very large organization where I'm in charge of application security, I am actually in agreement with with all of you, and especially Jason, who originally had this discussion with me, which is, I do want to know about all of the vulnerabilities. I'm now looking for solutions where I can consolidate all of those vulnerabilities into one place, deduplicate, and then get reports and push Jira tickets out accordingly. So uh, I am actually now looking at solutions that will make the consumption oh, of all you vulnerabilities you didn't, that much easier. You didn't easier. write that one too? Because you're you're amazing, Keith. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Paul. But no, unfortunately, I am not that uh, that ambitious, to say the least. So. <laughs> Jason, I think we had a question for you. I don't know. We just did a lot of discussion before. <laughs> no, no, it's, <laughs> it's fine. Too, I think the question got... around how do we kind of advance past finding vulnerabilities into fixing vulnerabilities mm -hmm. uh, in relation to developers and um, and it, and let me let me first state like I've never been a career developer, so I might be talking out of my ass. Who knows? Who knows? But um, you know, there are a lot of methods. There's there's training and there's you know like CBT kind of stuff, and um, that that goes you know back into the organization. But um, I don't think that vulnerability identification will ever be a thing that we're not doing. It, it might get less prevalent, right? Like uh, pen testing and dash scanning and even bug bounty. Um, like just as an example, right? I spent. I spent the majority of uh, the last project I worked on on a bounty against a newer framework that I can tell you just compared to previous uh, technologies um, had had less vulnerabilities. I didn't run into one cross-site scripting. I didn't run into one SQL injection or CSERF because the framework just protected against these things. And though there were edge case vulnerabilities and logic flaws that um, you know, we're inherent in the application. We are slowly, slowly moving towards elimination of certain classes of bugs, um, which is great. And especially in the bigger frameworks, like Microsoft is actually doing a really good job with some of this stuff inside of the framework. So, um, so I think that we, we will get to vulnerability elimination for some classes. I don't think it'll all the way go away. Uh, and how do we push left even further? Um, I don't know any way past um, integrating like that vulnerability disclosure with specific training um, to to developers, right? I don't know if there's like a silver bullet where I can say like, um, you know, like training is not the answer, right? I, I really believe that a, a secure and mature organization um, trains their developers and, and treats these bugs, you know, with the respect that they deserve, but also treats the developers with the respect they deserve and. Um, and builds, you know, analytics around what happens and make sure things don't regress. And um, those are the kind of things that I see with my customers that work really well. In fact, we have a couple customers who build um, their own training modules on every P1 that comes into their program, every stop the press bug. And what they do is they build a developer day where they go through and they say, hey, this actually happened on our site. Let's show you. Um, let's do, uh, let's put you in the role of the hacker who did this or the bug bounty hunter. Um, here's how to exploit this vulnerability. Here's the data that they got out. Here's how serious it was for us financially. And then here's how we fixed it. And we just want to make sure that something like this never happens again. Here's the resources you need to push it. I know that's complicated and manual and that's a human thing, but I think that right now that's the best that I could ask for from a mature security organization. I don't know if that answers your question, though. Well, Jason. It was an opinion question, so that's good. All right. Jason, I have uh, five questions. These oh. are also uh, all opinion-based questions. No, right no, this or... is where we stump you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so are you ready to play five questions with Security Weekly? Oh, boy. Here we go. Yeah, let's do it. Three words to describe yourself. Really stump. silly dad. If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? A spoon. If you were to write a book about yourself, what would the title be? Too much gaming. In the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? Oh, second? Are you sure? You sounded a little unsure of yourself there, Jason. I, I, I don't know. I don't know what that means. But, Final answer. Uh, <laughs> I, I was going to say, yeah. but aren't you? Aren't you like the master of recon for that? Uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, uh, that was that was funny. So I made a, a very good typo the other day where I submitted a talk on uh, discovery and recon, 
And another, you know, name for discovery and recon is asset discovery. And I put the talk submission out as asses discovery, which didn't go over super well. So nice. that's the running in Taijin. I would say second, right? I want to be, I want to be aware of what's happening first so that I can respond appropriately in that game. So let's, let's say second. Jason, choose two celebrities to be your parents. Alive, dead, it's fictional, no or otherwise. Oh, okay. So two celebrities to be my parents. Um, let's say, uh, oh God, this is a crazy question. Uh, two celebrities, uh, Robert Downey Jr. for my father at his best, not at his worst. Um, <laughs> and, uh, Anna Kendrick as my mother. Jason, thank you very much for appearing on this episode of Paul Security Weekly. Thank you very much for having me. With that, we'll take a short break. Come back with none other than Keith Hoodlet for our technical segment. 